Please note, we would like to make it very clear, we are totally against the form of discipline described in the articles and accounts being used on minors and non-consenting adults. Although some of these accounts are fictional, and others may be an exaggerated reality, none of them are too far from the truth of what really happened back in those days. Although I am almost 60 now, I can still clearly remember an evening in the Iowa wintertime when I was in my formative years. I had come down with a nasty chest cold and was lying in bed, sniffling and coughing and feeling sorry for myself. Mother came into my room, as she had done many times before when I was sick, carrying a tray containing a bottle of thick black cough syrup, a huge jar of Vicks Vaporub, a jar of her Pond's cold cream, a tablespoon, and a stack of flannel cloth rags with safety pins on top. I didn't want any part of that treatment that night and told her so. Well, she was surprised to hear me talk like that, but said that I was sick and the Vicks would make me feel better. I had never really talked back to my mother before, but that night I foolishly decided to really rebel. I was actually yelling, between coughs, that the stuff was old-fashioned and stunk and didn't do any good at all. I finished my tirade with the loud declaration that I wasn't going to take any of it, and she must really be stupid for still wanting to use it. She didn't say anything, she just set the tray down on the nightstand and pulled my covers down. I'm still not sure how she did it, but I was suddenly grabbed by the arm and in an instant, she was sitting on the bed and I was draped over her lap. Spanking was not a frequent occurrence at our house, so I was surprised and terribly embarrassed when she started to spank my bottom with her hand. I was sobbing and crying long before she was finished. I think her arm got tired before her anger abated enough to stop. I crawled back into bed, still sobbing. She quietly informed me that she was now going to take care of my cold and that if I talked back to her again, she was going to get a strap and put me back in diapers. I was not dumb, so I said absolutely nothing. The only sounds coming from me were the tremulous sobs of a child who had not yet achieved the level of maturity that he thought he had. Before she was finished, I had quietly consumed two tablespoons full of the thick, bitter syrup and been smeared with very thick layers of Vicks on my chest, neck and back. They were then covered with the flannel rags and pinned to my pajamas. The final indignity was having my face covered with her terribly feminine cold cream. Vicks sometimes seemed to make my face rashy. Her last act before tucking me in and saying goodnight was to put some Vicks in a vaporizer near my bedside and plug it in. I was left with a very sore bottom, a badly bruised ego, and a hissing machine that was rapidly replacing all the oxygen in the room with menthol fumes. The treatment, less the spanking, was repeated three times the next day and on several other occasions of illness. Each time thereafter, the treatment was accepted without any negative comments from me. As I said, I wasn't dumb. I was a child born in the early 60s, my father was in the military and my mum was very much a homemaker, although she did have a part-time job at various times during my childhood. In our early years my upbringing was reasonably stable, with the odd move every few years all within the UK, as my father's military career took him to different postings. With three sisters and no brothers, the rules of the house were straightforward do as you are told, be on time, do not steal, do not backchat, and our parents' decisions were final. All of this was supported by an unwritten principle that actions have consequences, this meant a range of punishments including being sent early to bed, not being allowed out, as well as physical punishment of varying severity, which changed as we got older. My sisters were always smacked by mum, this was never as formal as my own punishment and usually resulted in them paying a visit over her knee or the side of the bed and receiving a spanking with her hand. Mum was not one for the ceremony and would punish almost immediately an offence had been committed or discovered and my sisters knew that resisting would only make it worse. Once into their teens mum switched from her hand to the slipper but corporal punishment for all three of my sisters became less and less frequent they seemed to learn quicker than me, but also knew how far to push and how to shift blame. My own physical punishment, 
was very much my father's domain, very formal, and his authority was never questioned by me. I accepted that life was about learning, and sometimes I would make the wrong choices, which would result in a lesson that was painful and at times humiliating. Physical punishment was always administered with the slipper or, once I was into my teens, the strap. If I was punished at school, as many children were back then, of course, I could expect similar retribution at home too. This was generally administered the evening after I had been whacked at school. This gave me 24 hours to reflect, and at times sweat, knowing what the following night was probably going to bring. As I say, my own spankings were always very different from those of my sisters. At times, they would be present when I was having my bottom smacked, but they understood that they had to sit quietly throughout, or risk being next for a sore backside. My parents divorced when I was 11 years old, and initially, I went to live with my mum, along with my sisters. This was a time when fathers got little in the way of access, and as the divorce was a bitter affair, with both parents spending more time on their arguments than their children, I soon began to come off the rails at school, and as mum did not punish me, apart from the odd whack with the slipper. Between 11 and 13, I got into lots of little spats, bits of shoplifting, and general naughtiness both in and out of school. School reacted with frequent use of the slipper, the plimsoll used on most English school children, damning report cards, and notes home to my mum. Despite these punishments, I paid no real heed, continuing to play the big I am. Just before my 13th birthday, mum gave up and I found myself back living with my dad. This was a huge shock, but actually, though I didn't appreciate it at the time, really what I needed. In only my first couple of weeks, I got the slipper three times from dad. I would be sent to have a bath, get changed into pajamas, then come back downstairs. I would then be instructed to touch my toes and listen as dad gave me a short lecture on why I was in this position and what my fate would be. This was usually followed by between four and six very solid wax, plumb in the center of my bottom. It stung, of course, but I always found myself comparing the punishment to school, and to be honest, it didn't really deter me. Don't get me wrong, I didn't enjoy it, but I wanted to challenge authority, and thought I could handle the consequences. Then one evening I came home from school and my father asked me to get out the homework from the previous day that had been marked by my teacher. I lied and said it was lost, but to my horror, Dad had a letter from the school to hand and had also made a phone call himself. This was the day I got my first strapping, and believe me, it changed my attitude to corporal punishment almost instantly. I experienced pain that was nothing like the slipper and shed tears like a waterfall. At the time, Dad showed no emotion as he used the strap on me but I learned in later years that he had been genuinely upset at having to punish me like that. Life continued to be difficult for our family. Dad and I moved about a fair bit, and as I turned 15, we fell on hard times and found ourselves living in a bed and breakfast establishment, which was really more like a hostel, as the rooms were shared. I won't go into detail but the prospect of punishment disappeared and I started to slip back into old habits at school and life in general. Looking back, my life was disrupted, mum had all but turned her back on me and I probably saw disruption as a way to deal with that, without recognising where others were trying to help me. During the early 70s in London, I was part of a hardcore group of six children who gathered regularly on the edge of the park, though sometimes our numbers swelled to as many as 10. Our ages ranged from 10 through to 12. One of the regular girls, who, incidentally, is now married to another one of our little gang, arrived one at our hangout one afternoon in some distress. She admitted she had been spanked and after some gentle teasing, she lifted her skirt and pulled her pants to one side so we could see. Her bottom looked like a bad case of sunburn, and this was a while after the event, so she had clearly received a sound spanking. One by one, the other kids admitted they had suffered the same ordeal at home, and they swapped their stories all, 
that is, except me. My dad was a lorry driver, so away from home a lot. Mostly it was just me and mum at home. She was a nurse and we had a very close, tactile relationship. That evening I approached mum and asked her if we could talk, she had always said I could come to her with any problem. I explained what had happened to the girl, and that I seemed to be the only one in the group who had never had my bottom smacked. I asked mum why she had never spanked me. She replied that I had always been rather a good boy, and in her opinion had never deserved a spanking, and anyway I was now way past the age where she would consider such a punishment. Now, here's the thing. When all your friends have experienced something, curiosity takes a hold, almost to the point of stupidity. I asked mum if she could spank me regardless, so I knew what they were all talking about. I felt I'd missed out. Her answer stumped me. She asked me, if a friend of yours put his finger in a mousetrap and he said it hurt, would you then do the same? I stood looking at her, eventually answering with a typically childish response to shrug of the shoulders and a dunno. I repeated that I felt I had missed out and the only person I could come to about it was my mum. Once again, I asked her if she could give me a spanking, just so I knew what my friends were talking about. I added, I know it will hurt, they've all said how much it stings. I could see the reluctance in mum's face. She told me, I want you to have a good think about what you're asking for. In a few hours' time, if you still want to go through with it, then yes, I will spank you before bedtime. But let me warn you, there will be no half measures. A spanking is a spanking. It's supposed to hurt and once I begin spanking you, there will be no crying off, you'll be committed to the bitter end. Do you understand? I nodded. Well, cometh the moment, having stewed for over an hour, I asked mum if she would carry out my request. I told her I understood what I was letting myself in for, even though, in retrospect, clearly I didn't. Mum turned a chair around and sat facing me. She told me, you can walk away now and we can have a laugh about it all later. But once we agree to go ahead, I'm not going to stop until you've been thoroughly spanked. It's your call. Looking back, it's clear she was giving me every opportunity to walk away, but I went and put my finger in that mousetrap. I asked her if she understood why I was asking, that I wanted to say I had been spanked too, among my group of friends. Mum was very understanding, calm and matter-of-fact in her manner. She said, we'll talk this through properly tomorrow. I love you to bits, but you'll learn a lot from this experience and the memory will last a lifetime. For a second we looked at each other, there was nothing more to say. Mum broke the silence, if you're sure, then now is the time. Take down your shorts and pants once you've bared that bottom for me, there's no going back. I was extremely nervous. I knew it was going to hurt, but I was totally unprepared for what followed. Nevertheless I obeyed the instruction and bared my bottom. Once I had done that, I stood in front of mum with my hands over my privates, feeling very vulnerable. Mum spoke quite calmly. She took hold of my arm and repeated that there was no going back now, I was going to get the spanking I had asked for. As she spoke, she pulled me towards her and with the words, over you go, I found myself over my mother's knees for the first and only time in my life. This being the early 70s short or mini skirts were the fashion. Mum had a short skirt and a pair of sandals on and a white blouse, which I seem to remember was part of her nurse's uniform. I looked down at the carpet, I couldn't quite reach the floor on either side, so I was laid across my mum's knee like a naughty baby. From that moment, my only memories are about how much that spanking hurt. The first few smacks from mum's hand were a shock and yes, they stung and I seemed to recall, from the other side of mum's lap, seeing my shorts and pants dangling around my ankles. Then the stink began to get really uncomfortable as the friction built up on my bottom. I tried to hold on and began gasping and naturally moving my arms and legs. 
The spanking continued, the sting was intense, each smack jolted my whole body. Mum wasn't holding anything back. I instinctively reached back to protect my poor bum, but my hand was held with superhuman strength. I slipped forward and suddenly found I was over just the one need now I couldn't move my legs. I pulled faces and squeezed my eyes tight. I told mum it was hurting. She just said, I know. I asked when she was going to stop, but her only response was, when I'm good and ready. I am not entirely sure how long into the spanking this was, but with the struggle for freedom lost and unable to protect my stinging rear, I remember shaking my head from side to side. The carpet blurred as the tears started, overwhelmed with the burning sensation in my bum. I relaxed, accepted my fate, and lay still and cried as mum continued to spank me, hard and fast. To this day, I have no idea how long that spanking lasted. I only know mum stopped a while after I began crying. My bum was really on fire, my nose was running and I was still crying a few minutes, after she lifted me up. Mum gave me a hug, then she said in a very matter-of-fact manner, so, now you know what a spanking feels like. But at that moment, my only concern was the intense burning behind me. Mum picked up my shorts and pants, gave them back to me with a kiss, then turned me towards the stairs, adding a very unwelcome firm smack on my already stinging bare bottom, as she sent me to bed. Once I got to my room, I laid down on my side and rubbed my saw behind for a while. The next day we spoke about the whole thing. Mum told me she had hated doing it, but that I would remember it for the rest of my days. She wasn't wrong. I asked how long she had spanked me for. Mum had no idea. She said she had just spanked me until she felt the time was right to stop, mother's instinct maybe. I told her it had hurt in a way that I didn't expect, that I couldn't really explain, but I was glad I had at least, at last, experienced a spanking. We had a long hug. She ruffled my hair and kissed my head. Over the years which followed, there were one or two references made back to that day always in jest, threats of perhaps I needed a reminder of what a spanking felt like, or the promise of a good spanking across her knee, if I wasn't careful, for being cheeky. However, these were idle, light-hearted threats, never to be carried out. I still see one or two of the old gang now and then. Ironically, to this day not one of them know that I received that spanking. My first and second spankings were both given to me by my mother about 15 minutes apart, when I was about four years old. It was morning, and we were in the kitchen. I was sitting at the table in just my t-shirt and underpants. Mom wanted me to eat my oatmeal, and I refused. Finally, she sat down next to me and tried to spoon-feed my, just as she had when I was a baby. I wanted nothing to do with this, so I refused to even open my mouth and kept turning my head from side to side. After a few attempts, Mom put the spoon down on the table, reached over for me, grabbed me under my arms and pulled me across her lap. I had never been spanked before and was completely unaware that I was now going to lose my spanking virginity. Mom was very gentle and kind, she slapped my, but about six times, but it really didn't hurt much at all especially through underpants. She then picked me up and placed me back in my chair. Mom picked up the spoon and once again tried to feed me. Being the spoiled brat that I was, I still refused to eat by keeping my mouth closed and turning my head away. Mom could not believe it. She said, I guess we need another spanking and once more reached out for me. This time, of course, I knew what was about to happen. I tensed up and gripped the sides of the chair so she couldn't pull me towards her. She firmly told me to let go, but I continued to disobey. Finally she had to stand up, pull me and the chair up off the floor until my grip relaxed and I came loose. She sat back down, put me once again across her lap, held me very tightly and started spanking me again. This time, the punishment was really hard and lasted a long time. 
I screamed and cried, but it didn't put her off in the least. When she was finally done, she put me back in my chair. My bottom was so sore. I was still crying, with tears rolling down my cheeks, and my mouth was wide open with the sobbing. Mom again took complete control, and while my mouth was open, she put a spoonful of oatmeal in it. Eddie, eat everything or I will spank you again, she warned. At this point it was a little hard to do, but she realized I was trying to obey, so she wasn't as forceful. Eventually, she fed me the whole bowl, and I ate every single bite obediently. I don't remember what happened directly after these first two spankings, but I do remember that when it was time for lunch, I made sure I ate everything on my plate as quickly as I could. Mom was so pleased. She smiled and remarked, what a good boy. Miss Ross was a strict disciplinarian, a kind but firm presence in the classroom. She would never raise her voice, but there was a chilling undercurrent if you displeased her. It wasn't as if she sat at the front of the class flexing a long cane in readiness to deal out numerous whackings. A quiet word in the ear of the malefactor was usually enough. However, she was also a great entertainer and anyone, although it was always a boy, who broke her rules would be promised discipline. She would look up from her marking and see you whispering with a neighbor, casually, but with a hint of menace she would say. It's a cold day boys, but your bottoms will be feeling the heat if I see you whispering again. Once I got in a fight in the playground with a larger boy in the year above. The fight was stopped just as I was about to get pulverized, Miss Fleetwood, stately institution, and headmistress glided effortlessly into the ring of children, pulled us apart, with an impartial slap for both combatants. Miss Fleetwood had the loudest voice of anyone I have ever known. RSMs and town criers would kill for a voice like hers. Some children had been known to faint if she even looked at them. If they had looked a little closer, they would have seen a twinkle in her eyes. She was when you got to know her, a battle axe with a heart of pure gold. Later that day we got a grand visit from the headmistress. I remember her regal tour of the classroom a word of praise here and there. I knew what the real purpose of her visit was. She stood close behind me with Miss Ross. I was pretending to be fully occupied in writing, this was their conversation, as near as I can remember it. This boy must be a great trial to you Miss Ross. Yes he is, a great trial Miss Fleetwood. If he gives you any trouble you know how best to deal with him. A well-smacked bottom, too. Yes, a well-smacked bottom, and if that doesn't work, send him down to me and I shall see what I can find in my cupboard for him. Are you smiling at me young man? Get on with your work and don't you dare get into any fights again. They were golden days, with plenty of both laughter and tears. Another incident that stands out in my mind is when Miss Ross got sick of my friend, Michael and I being silly together, and moved us to opposite sides of the classroom. I sat next to a paragons of saintly virtues, a little girl called Teresa, who was a house captain. She was the sort of little girl that abhors naughtiness, especially in boys, which is why she had been selected as a suitable neighbor. We had four houses and the idea was you got stars for good behavior and black marks for bad, and every term the winner would be announced in assembly. Well truth be told I got my fair share of black marks, and I didn't get many stars either. Little Teresa would have sold her granny for a star, and I remember, on one occasion, her loudly saying in utter despair. How can we ever win with both Michael and James in the greens? One term things were building up to an exciting climax, and amazingly the greens were in the lead closely pursued by the reds, or maybe it was the blues. Miss Ross had caught Michael, and I fooling around with the powder paint and the stuff had gone everywhere. She was really furious and gave us one black mark each. Poor little Teresa was inconsolable. Please Miss Ross, don't give them black marks, can't you smack them instead, she wailed. She was a cruel woman that Miss Ross, she knew how to hurt a boy. Due to my abiding interest in corporal punishment, 
I do find myself visiting a number of websites related to the subject. There are those who have a keen interest in CP and experienced it without regrets as a child. In my experience, these people tend to be older and were at school in the days when CP was still legal. Then there are those who were badly abused in the past and who mostly have a natural aversion to CP. However, even some of this group may still considerably less harsh use of spanking as a reasonable discipline. On the other hand, there are those who consider a mere single slap to the clothed bottom to be abuse the latter tend to be from a younger generation. So we found that those supporting CP in the home are often abused online by others who suggest that they are in favor of toddlers being harshly whipped, which is hardly fair comment. The long and short of it is that we've gone from one extreme to the other in the past century, and thus I believe discipline and punishment were more balanced when I myself was in full-time education, half a century ago. Roald Dahl writes about CP at several schools in his childhood. He was so anti that he told his headmaster at Repton School that he would refuse to cane younger boys in the event of him being made a prefect. The result was that he never was. Dahl's anti-CP sentiments were so strong that they formed the basis of one of his short stories, Galloping Foxley, which was adapted for television in the series Tales of the Unexpected. My own father attended a prep school where the headmaster once caned the entire class Later, because he was dissatisfied school, my dad work. was caned by prefects. He also administered the occasional punishment himself in time although, as a fair-minded man, I can't imagine that he abused this privilege. Dad was quite philosophical about his boarding school experiences, he said that the prefects maintained discipline, so allowing the masters to teach. I remember once watching my sister being spanked by mum with a light kitchen spatula. Perhaps rather inadvisedly, my sister's response to the smacking was to keep yelling it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. Quite possibly it didn't, but it was still a foolish thing to say. That aside, my only real experiences of CP were at school. I attended a small private primary school. One boy had his knuckles wrapped with a his ruler by the strict headmistress and proprietor, but I think he was more upset by the fact that the punishment broke his ruler, rather than the pain in his hand. For the next year, I attended a private prep school. Here, CP wasn't common, but it was quite an event when it did occur. Only the headmaster used to beat the kids, only boys, never the girls, and he used a long-handled wooden spoon known as the basting spoon. I can recall several instances when a boy incurred his wrath, resulting in his roaring, I shall bring up the basting spoon. You could have heard a pin drop as he galloped down the stairs to his study, while every child held their breath. Two boys were disciplined for throwing a ball of paper at each other, one boy was brought from another class by his four mistress for being cheeky to her, while a third was punished for gabbling and shouting out nonsensical answers. In retrospect, the latter possibly suffered from Tourette's, which of course wasn't recognized back in the mid-1960s. On each occasion, the miscreants were ordered to bend over and received three hefty whacks with the spoon. Nowadays that would seem barbaric, but I suppose it was nothing more than a short, sharp shock that stung but didn't leave marks and generally kept boys on the straight and narrow. As an example of just how much stricter discipline was in those days, the biggest scandal in my time there came when four boys were ordered to report to the headmaster's study after assembly. The basting spoon was applied to each of their bottoms in turn. Their crime. Someone had seen them eating sweets at the town's bus station, half a mile from the school, while still in uniform. My next school was a state primary my sister, and I attended as something of a fill-in measure while a house move went through. Dad had changed jobs, requiring relocation and thus presenting something of a problem, as private schools required you to give a term's notice before leaving. Although in the UK private schools are perhaps more strongly associated with corporal punishment. I have to say that I witnessed more spankings at the state primary in one and a half terms than I did in a whole seven years at my big school later on. Practically every boy in the class, myself included, 
ended up bending over for a slippering at some point or another. However, unlike the scary environment at my previous school, when spankings were given here the atmosphere was almost jocular. Each of the four master slippers, plimsolls, of course, had names for my first time, I received Archie. When your behavior was felt to have crossed a certain threshold, you were called out from your seat, told to bend over, received your wax and returned to your seat. The spanking stung and brought tears to your eyes, but it was generally only around three strokes and was quite bearable. Then the lesson continued. One of the few occasions when I recall the master actually sounding angry was when one boy was heard in conversation with a boy from another class in the corridor, and they used naughty words. The resultant whacking seemed more severe than most. Girls never got their bottom smacked, at least not in school. Maybe they were simply better behaved than the boys, but more likely it might have been against the local regulations. After we finally moved house, I spent just over a year at another state primary school. However, here there was little evidence of CP going on. I certainly witnessed none, though I did hear of a boy being slippered in another class for back chat. Finally, I attended an old-fashioned boys public school. CP was certainly used, but slipperings and canings in the senior school were rare enough to become hot news topics around the school very quickly. In the junior school, some housemasters were much more likely to slipper boys than others. This generally happened in private, although I recall a couple of instances when a master administered a severe whacking in the class, or just outside the door, reducing the victim to a sorry, weeping state. In the senior school, being caught smoking was generally an automatic caning, although some housemasters never seemed to cane their charges preferring to issue lines or detentions. I must have mixed with a bad crowd, as several of my own friends were caned by their housemaster or the headmaster, either for smoking or general misbehavior. One morning, as my son came out of the shower, my son was startled to find me sitting cross-legged on the edge of his bed. He approached me nervously, realizing by the look on my face that something was wrong, and stood by my side. I narrowed my gaze on him and showed him the candy covers in my hand. He mumbled mama and simply dropped his head. I raised his chin, looked him straight in the eye and said, I found these under your bed as I was taking off the bed sheets for washing. Would you care to explain? He didn't say a word, but I could see that he was scared. I repeated my question, this time more directly and in a sterner tone. Have you been stealing candy from the jar and hiding the wrappers under your bed? Have you? Answer Fearfully, me. He admitted his misbehavior and apologized. I gave him a disappointed look and began to lecture him. You have let me down. Haven't I taught you that stealing is a bad thing? Yet despite that, you steal from your own mother. Did you really think I wouldn't find out? Were you not afraid of the consequences? You are in big trouble. Stealing is a major offense, and I am going to give you a very strict punishment tonight for what you have done. He began crying at the words strict punishment. Seeing him trembling before me with tearful eyes, I did feel sorry for him. I sat him sideways on my lap, put my hand around him, and comforted him. I told him, Mummy doesn't like punishing you but I need to correct you when you do something wrong and stealing has severe consequences. I have told you this before, haven't I? You know mummy will have to punish you. It's just how things are, my love. Bad actions have bad consequences, just like how good actions have good consequences. You have been a bad boy and so mummy will have to punish you. Is that clear? He nodded. I consoled him for a few more minutes, then sent him off, saying, Go throw these wrappers in the dustbin where they belong, and get on with your day. We will discuss this again at bedtime. The day went by smoothly. He has learned that the more mistakes he accumulated during the day, the more severe his bedtime spanking would be. So after earning corporal punishment, 
he usually puts on his best behavior for the rest of the day. Later that night, as we gathered for dinner, I could see that he was getting increasingly nervous. It was time for me to wear my strict mum hat and do the disciplining. So with a straight, stern face, as we ate I reminded him, straight to your room after eating. You know what's coming your way, don't you? Mummy is going to spank you hard and long tonight first with my hand and then with my slipper, like I always do. Tears rolled down my son's cheeks as he gulped his food down with difficulty. Again and again, he apologized and promised never to steal again, in spite of knowing full well that there was no escape from the punishment I was about to administer. After the meal, I washed the dishes, groomed myself for the night, and went to his room. I sat on the wooden chair and had him stand before me. Look at mummy. Look at me. Look into my eyes, don't look away when I am talking to you. Why are we here? Because I stole candy from the jar, mummy. What has mummy told you about stealing? It's a bad thing, and I must never do it. Then why did you do it? I'm sorry, mummy. That doesn't answer my question, why did you steal? He had no answer for that, but stood there sobbing and trembling with fear. What happens when you steal? Again, no reply, so I answered for him. You get a spanking. I pulled him closer and prepared him for the punishment, then I drew him to my right side and took him over my knee. I held my boy firmly, began smacking sharply. After a handful of these spanks, I upped the tempo with two brisk smacks. This new pattern continued for some time, before progressing to alternating smacks in sets of three. I chided him all the way through the spanking. You are a very naughty boy, taking candy without mummy's permission and hiding the wrappers under your bed. Mummy is very disappointed with you. You need to be taught a good lesson. This will make sure you never ever steal anything from anyone again. When I put him back on his feet, he was crying profusely. I wiped his tears away and glared at him, pursing my lips and widening my eyes. I tend to use a lot of stern gestures throughout the punishment, you know what's next, don't you? Yes. The slipper. I took hold of him and marched him to his bed, ordering him to lie over a couple of stacked pillows, while I retrieved the punishment slipper from the cupboard. I raised the slipper and smacked his bottom with it repeatedly. I smacked him hard, but gave him ample time between strokes to recuperate and appreciate the sting. He struggled, much like he had over my knee a few moments earlier, and tried covering his bottom with his hands. I patiently removed his hand. Once I was sure he had had enough, I told him to get up. Then he quietly went to his chair and wrote a short note in his diary about the infraction and chastisement, while I put the slipper back. After he had written his little note of confession, I beckoned him to approach me again. Will you ever steal again, young man? No, mummy, I promise. I opened my arms and he ran into them. I cuddled him. He cried quite a bit that night. I stayed by his side and comforted him, telling him that I loved him and would not have had to punish him had he stuck to my rules. I remember many spankings while I was growing up. Mother always carried them out. I had to bend over and the slipper would whack down across my tea bottom. The spanking I remember the most was when my friend James was sleeping over at my house. His mother always told my parents, that she should not hesitate to give him a sore bottom if he got out of hand. And that is just what she did this night, when we were both about seven years old. We were both quite restless when we went to bed. I always slept on the floor of my room when James came and he had my bed. We decided to have a pillow fight. Well, I don't really think it was decided it just seemed to happen. James hit me and I hit him back. Then I grabbed hold of James and feathers fell out all over the bed and onto the floor. Mum had heard us and in she came to see what all the noise was about. We froze, just the presence of my mum had us silent and scared. 
I can't trust you at all. Can I? She said in a very angry voice. I'll be back. I knew what was coming and sure enough, Mother soon re-entered the room carrying the large rubber-soled slipper she always kept in her wardrobe for the purpose of smacking my bottom. I was first. I had bent over her maternal lap, with my bottom feeling exposed and defenseless. Whack! The first stroke landed on my right cheek. Whack! Then on the left, and so on. I got three strokes on each cheek, and every stroke increased the sting in my posterior. By the last stroke, it was unbearable, I was crying like a baby. James had the same done to him. The first stroke was on his right cheek, as in my case, and I saw the red imprint the slipper left on it. Mother smacked each cheek a total of three times. I was so surprised because he didn't once cry out. She had finished and there we both were, clutching our sore backsides. Now clean up this mess and get some sleep, Mum ordered. We did as we were told and while I did so, I asked James how he could keep so quiet while Mum slippered him. Oh, I've had worse than that, he said. My mum takes the cane to me and that's worse. I couldn't help feeling lucky that my mum only used the slipper. This did change later, however, I will tell you about this another time. I was caught playing on the railway line and mum gave me two train lines with a bamboo cane across my backside for punishment. Well, that wasn't the last spanking received, but I never got the cane again. It was always there as a threat, but after that very memorable spanking, it was back to the good old slipper. There was, however, a dramatic change in the way I was spanked from then on. Mum must have decided that because I was getting older and therefore rebellious, she needed to be harsher with my spankings. So all punishments were given on the bare bottom, much to my dismay. I had to remove my pants and then my underwear before bending over to take the licks. The pain of the slipperings was worse, too. Mum hit ten times harder than she had before the train lines caning and the number of strokes increased. Instead of an old-fashioned six of the best, as mother used to to say, I received as many as fifteen pounding strokes. Slap, slap, slap. That slipper would do its punishing work and mum always slapped the same spot at least four times. She always reddened the whole of my backside, leaving no spot unpunished. Often, the slipper would be applied to my poor naughty bottom at bedtime, and I remember how painful it always was sitting down the next day at school. All this continued until I was sixteen. For some reason mum, considered me an adult at sixteen and stopped using corporal punishment. But I will never forget that slipper it did its job well. However, all instances of corridoring were recorded and if you were sent out three times in the course of a week, you could be sent for the cane. In my case one Friday late in my first term, at the school, I made the mistake of flicking an elastic band at someone and was sent out. Only then did I realize that it was the third such sending out that term and what that would mean. Later that day my form master told me that he had reported me and that I would have to see the headmaster after assembly on Monday. All weekend, I was worried about what was going to happen and on Monday morning I was more careful than usual to make sure that I was wearing the correct school uniform. In assembly I sat in a seat at the end of the row, so as to be able to leave when my name was called out. Then I noticed that the headmaster was not in his usual place on the stage. I started to think that I might escape, or at least gain a reprieve. But it was not to be. Towards the end of assembly the senior mistress announced, that she would be punishing a fourth-year girl for smoking. She read the name out, Lindsay Rushworth, Form 4B, wait for me outside my office. A tall girl with long brown hair stood up, and blushing as everybody looked towards her, walked out of the hall. While she was still on her way Mrs. Seaton went on to say that, in the absence of the headmaster, she would be punishing the boys, too. She read out my name and form and that I was to be punished for being sent out three times, and then told me, too, to wait outside her room. 
As I walked out, I was still very scared about what was going to happen, and fearing that tears were coming, looked down at the floor as I walked out, but I do remember that I felt fortunate at least in Asmuk, as it was Mrs. Seaton, who would be caning me and not the headmaster. I caught up with Lindsay in the corridor leading to Mrs. Seaton's office, which was opposite that of the headmaster. I didn't say anything to her. I was still very frightened and, in any case, I don't think I'd ever spoken to anyone in the fourth year, they were a long way senior to us first years. We walked slowly to the office door and stood outside. There was still some time to go until the assembly was dismissed. Suddenly Lindsay said something to me. I realized that my hands had been subconsciously rubbing the seat of my short trousers. I jerked them away and looked up at Lindsay. Pardon. Lindsay was a very nice girl. Although she must have been, with good reason, as fearful as I was, but she still tried to ease my nerves a little. She told me not to worry and said that as it was my first time, I would probably only get a couple of strokes, and that it wouldn't hurt all that much. She said that the only thing I had to remember was to do exactly what Mrs. Seaton said, as soon as she said it. We heard the sound of the assembly breaking up and fell silent. As the classes trooped by at the end of the corridor, several pupils glanced towards us as we stood unhappily outside the office. I knew that they would be imagining what would soon be happening to us. After everyone had gone past Mrs. Seaton came marching up. She looked at both of us as if we were something rotten that the cat had dragged in, and, without saying a word, went straight into her office. Lindsay made a face at me and we continued to stand outside in silence. After what seemed to be ages, but was probably no more than a minute or two, the door opened again and Mrs. Seaton called Lindsay in. I stood close to the door trying to hear what was happening, but I could only make out the sound of voices and not what they were saying. It was easy to guess, though, that Lindsay was getting a good telling off. Then, out of the blue, a shockingly different sound the thwop of a cane smacking onto Lindsay's bottom. A silence followed, and then another thwop. I thought I heard a gasp from Lindsay. I shivered, thinking about my own turn, coming soon. After a similar interval there was the sound of another stroke. This time there was no doubt about it. The impact was followed swiftly by a sharp cry of pain. I wondered how many strokes Lindsay was going to get. As regular as a metronome, the next stroke landed. To my horror this elicited a real scream and the sound of poor Lindsay bursting into tears. I was very close to tears myself but couldn't help listening in horrified fascination. Despite Lindsay's reaction the fifth stroke followed after the now familiar pause. Poor Lindsay. This time there was an almighty yell, sounding really loud even through the closed door. I heard thudding sounds and Lindsay's voice, raised and tearful. There was a longer pause, when all I could hear was raised voices, then it went quiet again, but no sixth stroke followed. I was beginning to think that Lindsay's punishment was over although five seemed an odd number of strokes, when I heard again the awful sound of that cane, but even louder than before. Again the stroke resulted in a shriek from Lindsay followed by loud sobbing. Two more strokes followed quickly, with similar reactions. By now I felt really dreadful. There was another long pause. The office door opened. I thought I was going to be sick. Lindsay stumbled out, tears were pouring down her face, half hidden by a tissue. Behind her Mrs. Seaton beckoned to me, marling. Trembling with fear, I walked into the office. I saw a cane, about three feet long, lying on the teacher's desk. Mrs. Seaton gave me a real telling off, saying how important it was to behave in class and not to disrupt the lessons for everyone else. I tried to pay attention, so that she would see how sorry I was, but all I could think of was the effect that awful Cain had had on poor Lindsay, and that I was about to get the same. You were sent out of the classroom three times last week, Marling. I am going to give you one stroke of the cane for each time, and one extra one, for putting me to this trouble. 
How many strokes is that? Four strokes, miss. We called all the women teachers, miss, whether or not they were married. Yes, Marling. Four strokes. You've never had the cane before, have you? She could probably have guessed this from the expression on my face, but I suppose that it was on the school records. I shook my head. Well, Marling, a caning is a serious punishment. You are here because you have persistently misbehaved over the last week. I shall now try to show you just how seriously we take your misbehavior. The cane is supposed to hurt, and I can assure you that it will hurt a lot. I expect you to stay in position throughout your punishment, until I tell you that you can stand up. Did you hear how many strokes Lindsay Rushworth got? I didn't know why she was asking and didn't know what to say. I'm not sure, miss. She got eight strokes, Marling. I don't think that young lady will be sitting down comfortably for a long time. But she was only due to get six strokes. Lindsay got two extra strokes, because she made the mistake of standing up after just five strokes. I hope that you profit from her example and stay bent down until I tell you to stand. If you interrupt your caning in any way, standing up, putting your hands in the way, kicking your shoes off anything like that you will get extra strokes too. Do you understand? I nodded my head in dumb misery. Good. Well, let's get this over with so we can both get back to work. Take your trousers off and put them on the chair. I was shocked. I hadn't expected this. I made no move Come to on, obey, Marling. Lindsay got it on her knickers, and I don't see any reason why you shouldn't get it on your pants. Now, don't waste my time unless you want extra. I was sniffing away tears, as I reluctantly lowered my short grey trousers and placed them on the chair. My little bottom felt so vulnerable. Mrs. Seaton picked up her cane from the desk. Now, I want you to bend right down over the desk, holding on to the other side. And you stay there until I give you permission. My legs were trembling as I stretched myself over the desk. It was wide and I could only just hold on to the edge with my toes on the floor. I tried to make my grip as firm as possible and closed my eyes tight, shut and waited. I was concentrating so hard that I didn't notice any movement by Mrs. Seaton or any sound of the cane. Suddenly, though, my bottom exploded in pain. It wasn't a line of pain across my bottom. My whole backside was suddenly on fire. I squirmed over the desk, holding on desperately, determined not to earn extra strokes. The awful smart got worse and worse. I still had three to come. Tears were squeezing out of my shut eyes. This time, I heard Mrs. Seaton move and tried to tense myself. To no avail. The cane smashed down again, and the awful pain in my rear went to a new level. Cotton underpants were no protection at all against that vicious cane. I yelled out in agonized protest, trying to let the teacher know how much she was hurting me. She knew. Not pleasant, is it, Marling? It's not supposed to be. Two more to come. I held on although all my instincts were yelling at me to stand up and hold my poor bum. The third stroke landed lower than the first two had, whether intentionally or caused by my involuntary wrigglings across the desk. It whipped down across the very tops of my thighs and stung like bloody hell, even worse than those first two strokes. I screamed at the top of my voice and writhed over the desk in agony. Somehow I managed to stay down and to channel all of my efforts into holding on. But I was sobbing as I awaited the fourth and final stroke. Mrs. Seaton kept me waiting for a long time, sobbing over her desk, my poor little bottom bouncing up and down as I awaited the last stroke. Finally it came. Another real stinger across the center of my bottom. I howled out in pain again, but still kept a grip on that desk. I didn't want to earn extra strokes now. The senior mistress kept me bent over like that for about a minute, still crying, my bottom flooded with pain. Finally, 
She patted me on the back and told me to stand up. I can still remember my relief. I stood up slowly, my whole body was hurting, and pressed both hands to my poor injured bottom. Trousers back on. This took a while, given the painful state of my posterior. Eventually I stood, still tearful, facing Mrs. Seaton. My hands were carefully massaging my smarting rear. I could feel the mark left by that wayward third stroke on bare flesh, not covered by my short trousers as the Mrs. others were. Mrs. Seaton passed me a box of tissues, and I took one and tried to dry my eyes. She warned me to behave myself in future, and told me that if I didn't like the cane from her I would like it a lot less from the headmaster. As I walked unsteadily from her room I resolved never to get the cane again. When I was eleven I moved up to a co-educational grammar school. Minor instances of misbehavior in the classroom were punished by the boy or girl concerned being sent out of the class into the corridor. After a few minutes the teacher would generally let you back into the class. I was a real chatterbox in school, particularly during my primary years, and my talking in class frequently got me into trouble with teachers. One day, when I was in the second year of primary, so six years old, I got told off several times by Miss Moore, my teacher, but kept whispering to my friend Paul Thomas, who sat next to me. I can't remember now what we were finding so interesting. Eventually, I was even made to stand in the corner for a while during the lesson, but even after I was allowed back to my desk, I got talking yet again. Eventually, Miss Moore put me back in the corner and said she'd deal with me at break time. I stood there, facing the wall, and feeling that it was extremely unfair because Paul had been talking too. Eventually the bell went for break and I was left alone in the classroom with my teacher. She was probably quite young, in her mid-twenties, though she seemed ancient to a six-year-old, of course, and had long, shoulder-length hair with a center parting in a typical 1970s style. I heard a chair being dragged around, then my name was called. Andrew, come here to me. When I turned around, my teacher was sitting in the chair, which she had set out at the front of the classroom. I went to her side as directed. I remember I didn't feel frightened, just frustrated. I was expecting a more formal, and much longer, telling off of the sort I'd already experienced earlier. Well, I got the first bit right. Miss Moore droned on and on about how I was constantly disrupting her lessons and making it difficult for the other children to learn. Then, to my absolute astonishment, she added, well, I think we'd better see what a smacked bottom will do. Before I could say anything in pleading or protest, Miss Moore took me by the wrist and put me across her knee. I have to say it was a position I was quite used to, as my mum was certainly not above taking my pants down and thoroughly spanking me when she thought I needed it. But to have a lady who was not my mum do it was pretty shocking. Thankfully, Miss Moore didn't remove any clothing to smack me, and at first I thought I was going to get off pretty easily. But in this traditional punishment position, my school shorts and pants were tightened quite effectively against my bottom, and when she first struck me, I was really surprised by the amount of sting generated. Miss Moore evidently had quite a hard hand. But eventually, it was the sheer length and slow burn of the spanking which made me start to cry unashamedly. The heat on my seat just built up and up. I must have been over Miss Moore's knee for around five to ten minutes, having every part of my bottom thoroughly smacked and then re-smacked. The heat on my seat just built up and up. I must have been over Miss Moore's knee for around five to ten minutes, having every part of my bottom thoroughly smacked and then re-smacked. After a while, the only thing I remember was the sound of slapping and me wailing. Bottom blazing, I was finally let up. Miss Moore was flushed in the face from administering the smacking and smelled strongly of sweat, presumably from the sheer physical effort of chastising me. She took out a handkerchief and dried my eyes for me, then wiped a few beads of perspiration from her own forehead with it. Well, Andrew, I hope that's taught you a salutary lesson, and we won't have any more problems with you talking. 
away outside with you. I rushed out of the classroom, with a fire in my pants, but I couldn't face my friends, and hid in the boys' toilets for the rest of break time. I spent a miserable afternoon sitting uncomfortably on a very sore bottom, and the afternoon got even more miserable when Miss Moore went over to my mum at home time, and told her that I had been smacked, and why. As soon as we got out of the classroom, mum promised me another smacked bottom when we got home. And that's exactly what I got, though this time, of course, my shorts and pants came down before I was put back in that familiar position. Mum was a champion bottom smacker, and my little rump had probably never been as sore as it was when I was put to bed early with no tea. At junior school the headmistress was rather a scary woman who terrified even the boys. Our usual easy-going teacher was ill one winter, it was snowing and I think the miners were on strike, see 1966, as we couldn't get any coke for the boilers. To make matters worse we had the headmistress herself teaching us. Halfway through the afternoon, she had to leave us alone for ten minutes, so she left the monitors in charge with strict instructions that the names of any talkers should be reported to her. Well when the cat's away the mice will play and we threw caution to the winds and we got noisier and noisier. When she came back she was furious and asked the monitors who had spoken. They made matters worse by saying they hadn't seen anyone. All the class had to line outside her office, and I remember a very nice boy, who had been caned before telling me to rub my hands very hard, as it would hurt more if my hands were cold. I was told it was best to be in the back of the queue, because she would be less angry by then. I remember when it was my turn, I was shaking so much, I couldn't keep my hand still. Everyone got one on each hand except for the monitors who got double rations. The girls were nearly all really upset, and I remember feeling proud of myself for not crying. I went to schools in two different parts of what could be called North West London in the early 60s. My own experience of monitors is sadly the same as Sarah Jane's. Most of them would happily shop their grandmothers and teachers, when on the lookout for suitable candidates, would discount those children seemingly governed by the code of omerta. The scary headmistress in my first school, and boy was she scary, often left monitors in charge of classes. Not because she was scared of anarchy breaking out, but because she liked to encourage a healthy spirit of tale-telling amongst the monitors. Our monitors at the infant school were called Janet and John. This sticks in my mind, because our early readers were called Janet and John Books. Anyway, they were a prize pair and if they earned you a pair of smacked legs, the usual infant's classroom punishment, they would grin like a pair of Cheshire cats. Children were sent over the road for the cane, so they might well have had an escort. All victims returned in tears, but I can't remember much more about it. I do remember being told off for talking with my friend, and when my friend carried on I remember the youngish attractive school teacher, insist he take down his trousers and pants for a caning. He ended up being taken outside and later he returned in a tearful state, so I can't say if he was caned or not. The part of spanking stories that appeals to me the most is the embarrassment. I'm not sure why, but as long as I can remember, it's been that way. This story is pretty commonplace, but the aftermath is interesting and that's where the embarrassment, that makes it so memorable, comes in. I was very much in the stage of life that is marked by knowing it all and having a bad attitude. Unfortunately for me, my mother was quite proficient at adjusting attitudes. We got into some argument, I'm not even sure about what now, and she sentenced me to a spanking. Bare bottom, bent over with hands on the knees, five hard whacks with her old school paddle, followed by me jumping around and hollering. It was all very normal and at this difficult stage of my life, pretty commonplace, I found myself getting spanked for my attitude every other week, if not more often. The afternoon is when this story begins to become more interesting. I was on the swim team, as I had been for most of my childhood. I had just gotten moved up to an older age class for 12 to 14 year olds. I had just turned 12, 
so I was very much on the young end of the spectrum on the team. After our first practice, I discovered that nearly everyone on the team had already started to go through the changes of puberty. I had not. My chest was still completely flat, and I had no hair anywhere except for the top of my head. I was extremely self-conscious of this, so I got into the habit of changing as discreetly as possible. I would face the locker, practically leaning into it, then change as quickly as possible. Changing in this way exposed my butt to the room, but nothing else. Most days that was not a problem, but having just had a spanking in the past few hours, my butt was still rosy red. I did not realize how noticeable it would be and changed in my normal fashion, as quickly as I could, which was not quick enough. I heard from behind me, oh my gosh. Did you get a spanking? It was one of the oldest girls on the team, a 14-year-old that I really wanted to impress. I tried to ignore the question, that definitely didn't work. Gillian, were you a naughty girl? Did your mommy spank your hiney? she asked, laughing. I turned around, hoping to quiet the situation down before my but became a topic of conversation for the whole team. Another 14-year-old chimed in. I can't believe you still get spanked. I haven't been spanked since I was a little girl. Although, she added and gestured with her head towards my still prepubescent body, looks like you still are a little girl, so I guess it fits. There was some more laughter and I started to tear up. Surprisingly, the first girl came to my rescue. Lay off, she said. I bet most of us have had a whipping every once in a while. Tell me what happened. I told her that my mom had spanked me, but she wanted more details. She pressed me until I told her that I had mouthed off, that my mom used to paddle, and that I cried. She laughed at me throughout my account, but not really in a mean way kind of like a big girl teasing her little sister. The next time we were in the locker room, she saw my but and commented that it looked like I had been behaving myself. Then she planted a sharp hand spank right on my tush and told me to keep it up. After that, it was never mentioned again. My story goes back to the mid-50s, when my mother and her sister rented a place in Miami Beach for six weeks in mid-February to get away from the cold weather in Chicago. I was eight years old at the time, and my female cousin Cheryl was seven. The sisters were able to get a large, two-bedroom apartment one block from the beach. It was like paradise every day, we would go over to the beach, play in the sand and run into the warm water of the ocean. What fun! In the afternoons, Cheryl and I would go out to the courtyard and play hide-and-seek and other childhood games. There was also a park nearby where our mothers would take us so we could play on the jungle gym. My cousin was quite adventurous, and she loved to hang upside down on the parallel bars, showing off her cotton panties. Every day, they were a different color, and I marveled at how cute they were and got quite excited seeing her cute little bottom encased in this underwear. One day we were outside by ourselves and got called in for dinner. Instead of going right in, we decided to play another game of hide and seek. We lost track of time and some time later, my aunt came out looking for us and she was hopping mad. She caught Cheryl by her ear and began dragging her to the apartment, slapping her rear as I followed behind. What did I tell you, little miss, she demanded, as she continued smacking Cheryl's bottom. Someone's going to be a sorry little girl when I get them home. Needless to say, I was terrified. I was no stranger to being spanked myself, but I had been carefully behaving myself ever since the beginning of our trip. Once inside the house, my aunt went over to the couch. She put Cheryl over her lap, pulled up her play dress, and proceeded to really lay into the seat of her panties. My little cousin was bouncing all over her mother's lap, crying her eyes out and blaming me for wanting to play another game. My aunt continued to spank Cheryl, then asked my mother to pass her the hairbrush that was on the dresser. Now I was really getting scared, but kind of excited, as my aunt proceeded to pull Cheryl's panties down, 
and gave her a good ten smacks on her bare bottom with the hairbrush. Boy, was it red. I couldn't help staring at it. Cheryl continued to bawl her eyes out. She was promising her mommy that she would be a good girl, but also blaming me over and over. Finally her mother let her up, made Cheryl stand in front of her while she was rubbing her well-spanked bottom and continued to scold her. Needless to say, my mother had been paying close attention to the corporal punishment being mitted out. She turned to me and said, Well, young man, it seems to me that you at least had a half share in this misbehavior, so it seems only fair that you should get exactly what Cheryl has just been given. Come here to me. She sat down on a nearby chair and crooked her finger at me. Very reluctantly, I approached her. There were no half measures with me. My mom immediately lowered both my shorts and my underpants and I blushed at the thought that Cheryl was getting as good a look at my private areas as I had of hers. I didn't have long to think about that, though, as mom grabbed my left wrist and placed me firmly over her knee, beginning to spank me with her hand almost immediately. My bottom was burning already and I knew I had the hairbrush still to come. I broke down in tears as mom disciplined me and I noticed Cheryl, still bare-bottomed herself, staring at my own naked rump as it bounced up and down under the hard slaps. Finally, the moment came. Hand me that hairbrush, will you? My aunt obliged and suddenly the temperature in my rump rocketed. It was a whole new world of pain, and I got far more than the ten strokes which had been applied to Cheryl's bottom. Afterwards, we were both sent to bed early in disgrace, with no dinner. Those hungry tummies and sore bottoms made sure both us children behaved like angels for the rest of that holiday. I grew up in Malaysia. My sister and I were trained from when we were quite young to be good girls. We were both usually obedient and well-behaved. As such, we rarely got into trouble for behavioral issues. Nevertheless, we were still routinely punished. Why? Well, this is what makes my story unique from the dozens I have read. Our mother was our disciplinarian. She was very strict and micromanaged all aspects of our lives until we graduated from school. Academic work was of paramount importance. Our mother wanted us to not just do well, but excel academically, and she pushed us really hard on this front. You might have heard of the Asian tiger mom well, our mother was certainly one of those. Growing up, my sister and I were not allowed any sleepovers, we were rarely granted permission to watch television and we could play outside with others only at the weekends. We came home from school, had our snacks, and went straight to doing our homework. When we were young, our mother spent several hours each evening monitoring our studies. She would check our homework, give us lessons at home, and even quiz us to assess how well we were learning. She was our teacher, pretty much. Mum believed in using corporal punishments to bring out academic excellence. She always kept a ruler and cane in close proximity during these evening sessions. If we made mistakes or showed any lapse in concentration, she would beat us. During our younger days, Getting the ruler a few times for some mistake or the other during studies was a daily affair. The most common form of punishment was a hard swat of the ruler on our open palms. At times, she would even smack our knuckles, which was very painful. Even if we made a simple spelling mistake, our mother would draw our hands out and smack it a couple of times. We then had to write the misspelled word a dozen times. The ruler was also applied to our thighs and the side of our arms during these study sessions, as these parts were easily accessible and deemed suitable for a couple of quick, sharp swats. When mum decided to be more formal, we were made to stand up and bend over our study desks. My mother would then position herself beside us and beat our backsides and legs. The cane was reserved for more serious stuff like scoring below mother's expectations on a test which, by the way, was a minimum of 96%. We would also be caned if we got a note home from school. 
We even got a few strokes for mistakes during evening studies, especially as we got older and the cane was used more frequently. We always had to bend over our desks for the cane. Mum simply gave us a few stinging strokes across skirts. Sometimes, she would also order us to hold out our hands afterward and add a few extra strokes on our open palms. Mother caned us hard, such punishments were very painful and always left marks. My sister and I would dread coming home with a test score below mother's minimum. I remember, I got a 90 in mathematics, one time the lowest I ever scored. I was so afraid to face my mother that day. I handed her my test and began to cry. Mum glanced over it, gave me a steely look, and scolded me soundly for failing her. Then she dragged me inside and caned my bottom. I received two strokes for every mark below Mum's minimum. These frequent punishments for academic matters kept my sister and me on the straight and narrow. We rarely actually misbehaved because of the fear of mother's discipline. You may well think that my mother's punishments were harsh, but they were successful. After the maths test I mentioned, I scored 100% next time. Both my sister and I excelled academically, and we have built successful professional careers. How long in my life have I spent fantasizing about spanking? It is a shame someone didn't put me on an hourly rate years ago, as I might now be a wealthy man. Incredibly I am, despite being middle-aged and happily married daydreaming still. I must have been about 10 when I first consciously became aware of fantasizing. The rain was falling on the roof, and I was lying with the lights switched off on my bed one evening and I thought of the lovely Miss Ross. Her perfumed presence had been driving me wild all year. I wasn't the only one either, as she made a nice change from the hairy-faced harridans and child-hating curmudgeons that had overshadowed my early schooling. The entire class loved this warm-hearted woman, who made going to school a joy and learning fun. Part of her charm was her attitude to discipline. On the surface, she was very strict, indeed I have in another posting described what she would do to small boys if she caught them out of their places. We were taught away from the main buildings of the school in a freezing little wooden hut. If any child complained, they were cold she would fix them with her sternest gaze and say, if you're cold the best way to warm up is with a well-smacked bottom. It was one of her little jokes, and I would often feign coldness just to hear her say that. If any child, although it was always a boy, as all the girls in our class were absolute paragons of virtue, did step over the bounds, he would be promised a warm bottom if he did it again. At the end of each term, she gave every one of us a small present, but she promised a special end-of-term present for the naughtiest boy in the class, a box of assorted wax. Sometimes impromptu discussions would break out on who was the likely candidate. As one of the front runners, I was often mentioned and the girls in particular seemed keen I should suffer, if that's the right word, as a revenge doubtless for all the teasing I had enjoyed at their expense. Well as she never did put me over her knee, pull my pants down and soundly spank me I was forced to daydream. One scenario was a spelling test in which she gave one whack with a slipper or springy little cane for each mistake. A variation was a piano lesson in which each wrong note earned a similar penalty. Who knows I could be another Mozart by now instead of someone who can barely play chopsticks. These daydreams that stirred up such strange feelings were a source of great delight and the variations were endless. I could be held over a desk or otk or over a vaulting horse although that one came a little later. It could be in private or in front of the class. I could even be held down by the six most virtuous girls as in Hermann Hesse's Peter Kamazund, although I admit I hadn't read that at ten. My bottom may be bare or my underpants would provide some modesty, or I could wear nothing but a nice tight pair of gym shorts and Miss Ross, a smile playing on her lips, chalks her thinnest cane in preparation for six crisp, unhurried, painful strokes. This inner life will be with me until they put me in a box. Miss Ross is now of course much younger than I and she has some rivals. 
Some woman will by some look or gesture capture my imagination, and I will transport her to that inner world, and she will become the strict school teacher of my dreams. Of course I am not really some sad old bugger, I am still ten going on eleven. I often wondered if teachers who gave the slipper or cane at school also gave it at home. Did anyone have a parent who was a teacher? Both my parents were teachers, however I never received corporal punishment at home. However, I was a very obedient child so probably gave them little cause, had I been a naughty child. My father certainly used the cane on boys when he first started teaching, my mother apparently would on occasions deliver a hard smack to the back of a girl's thigh. I see that one of your most sarcastic writers has been putting herself about on the British banking site where she will not be welcomed. She has given this forum as her home page and thus led me here. I once knew a man who was a primary school teacher. He was fond of giving the slipper to his pupils, particularly girls, and began to take his work home with him. Not having any children, he persuaded his wife to allow him to slipper her just before bedtime. She did not enjoy this and eventually left him when he insisted that she take her knickers down for punishment. He resigned from teaching in 1987 when physical chastisement was banned in state schools. No one who calls himself Brian can expect to be taken seriously. Your fantasy rubbish will no doubt stir members on British spanking, but will be treated with derision here. My innocent little comments on British spunking encouraged several lonely people to send me instant messages of a salacious nature. You will be pleased to know that I shall not when be contributing there again. There was one punishment worse than a spanking. It was reserved for the pet peeve of my mother. If she heard a bad word come out of any of her children, the culprit was in for an old-fashioned mouth washing. These were a threat until I moved out of the house when I turned 18. The last one I received at home was when I was 17. No matter how old or young the culprit, the procedure was always the same. It started when I came home from school. Normally, the second I walked in the door, I was on the phone with one of my friends. My mother usually worked until 5 p.m., so I usually had a few hours home alone with my brother and sister. But this day, my mother came home early and heard me say the F word to one of my girlfriends over the phone. All she had to do was look at me and I knew what to expect. I immediately hung up the phone and she announced, as she had many times, before that she needed to see me after dinner in the bathroom. My heart stopped when I heard those words, but I knew that any protest would be meaningless. I sat quietly through dinner and hardly touched my food. At the conclusion of the meal, mother again reminded me to meet her in the bathroom when the dishes were cleaned up. My face turned bright red as now my brother and sister knew what was about to happen. I gathered my nerve and walked up to my mother's bathroom. There, I found the punishment materials already laid out on the counter. A neatly folded white washcloth sat next to the sink. On it was placed a small bar of soap, like the ones found in hotels and motels. I put the lid down on the toilet and sat down. Tears began to fill my eyes, as all I could do was stare at the counter and the punishment tools. While it seemed like hours had passed, actually more like fifteen minutes, my mother walked in the bathroom and closed and locked the door behind her. My mother began to run hot water in the sink and slowly peeled the wrapper off the little bar of soap. As I sat back down on the toilet seat, I began to sob, knowing what was about to take place. I sat mesmerized as my mother wetted the washcloth in the hot water and began to work up a good lather with the small bar of soap. When she was satisfied that the cloth was well prepared, she called me over to the sink. I stood before her with tears running down my face. A very meek no rolled past my lips as I watched her pick up the small, gooey bar of soap. Open up, she commanded, as I felt her grab a handful of hair to hold my head still. With her other hand, she pushed the tiny bar of soap into my mouth in a well-practiced motion. Instantly, the horrible taste of the soap filled my mouth as more tears rolled down my cheeks. 
Now chew it all, she shouted at me, giving my hair a tug to emphasize her point. As I chewed the horrible little bar, the terrible taste of the soap intensified. Several times, I almost gagged as I chewed the soap up into smaller and smaller pieces. When my mother was satisfied that the bar had been thoroughly chewed, she picked up the soapy washcloth and began shoving it into my mouth, almost like a gag. The effect greatly intensified the putrid taste of the soap. Now start counting slowly, my dear, she said, and in very muffled tones I started counting from one to one hundred. As I counted, I drooled bubbles down my cheek. I also gagged several times on the horrible taste of the soap, but was careful not to lose count. Tears rolled down my cheeks, but my pitiful looks didn't have any effect on mother. Finally, I mumbled one hundred and she mercifully pulled the washcloth from my mouth. She quickly pushed my head into the sink and told me to spit. That command was hardly needed as, in a very unladylike fashion, I began to spit out as much of the soap as I could. After about two minutes, she pulled my head upward. Turning, she unlocked the door as the sounds of my brother and sister scurrying down the hall could be clearly heard. Not letting me put my blouse back on, she grabbed me by the arm and escorted me to my room. There she watched as I put on my nightgown and got into bed. You may not leave your room until midnight, is that understood, she said. Yes mother, I replied in a very small voice. She turned off the light and closed the door. I waited for a few minutes, then grabbed the waste basket and began spitting again trying to rid my mouth of the horrible taste. The soap coated my teeth and resisted every effort to remove it. I once smuggled a toothbrush in my room, but using it only resulted in a huge mouth of bubbles, aggravating the problem and taste. There was no way to avoid swallowing some soap, and my stomach churned and cramped as the soap did its worst. About 11 p.m., I finally fell asleep, still tasting soap as I dozed off. It was about 3 a.m. when I awoke with a horrible tummy ache. Still half asleep, I ran to the bathroom, where my bowels erupted the minute I sat down from the powerful laxative action of the soap. Before the alarm went off at 6 a.m., I had made several other mad dashes to the toilet. That morning I dressed and brushed my teeth several times with mint-flavored toothpaste in an attempt to remove the still-present taste of soap from my mouth. When I walked into the kitchen for breakfast, my mother walked up and gave me a big hug and kiss and told me how sorry she was for having to punish me. With tears in my eyes, I apologized for using foul language and promised to clean up my act in the future. To this day, I cannot remember the last time I swore or heard a foul word from my brother or sister. Mother would be proud to see when the way we turned out and I were growing up in Wyoming during the 1980s my mom spanked us pretty often. The tool she used for our discipline was an oval wooden paddle, which she referred to as the teacher, a pretty apt name, since it taught me and my brother a number of important lessons during our childhood. Mom was a struggling single parent who worked two jobs to keep us afloat, so she stood no nonsense when it came to our behavior, it was simply a distraction she didn't need. When you had been naughty, you were taken to mom's room for your punishment. The screams and cries of the boy being spanked would echo around the house, as would the sound of the wood coming down upon his bare bottom. I remember being taken for my first time very vividly. Up until that point, I had had my legs slapped if I was playing up, but by the time I got to five years old, I was considered quite old enough to see the teacher. I remember mom grabbing my hand and marching me up the stairs to my doom. Until I got spanked with it myself. I had not seen the teacher, but of course my brother delighted in regaling me with scary tales about it tales which the sound of his own crying reinforced whenever he got taken upstairs for it. I can't now remember what I had done wrong, but I do remember mom closing the bedroom door behind us, then going over to her dressing table and extracted the teacher. It wasn't huge but back then I had a little bottom and the paddle was big enough to easily cover both my buttocks at the same time. Mom sat on her bed 
and called me over to stand by her knee. There was a lecture brief and to the point, and then my shorts were taken down, swiftly followed by my underpants. As I say, I was used to slapped legs, but that rarely required the formality of pants being removed. Mom showed me how to lie across her lap, and I was trembling with fear, already crying pretty badly. This crying turned to wild screaming as she held me firmly and brought the teacher down on my now defenseless bottom. I had never felt so much pain in my young life and the next few minutes were just a tearful, snotty blur, to be honest. I have no idea how many she gave me. After I was let up off her knee, I stood there bawling for a few minutes, then went to pull my undies up. Mom landed another painful slap across my bare behind, this time with the palm of her hand, and said, Oh no you don't, mister. You just go over to the dressing table mirror and look at your backside. I want you to remember what a naughty boy's bottom looks like. I did as I was told and was horrified to see that my bottom was red, almost purple, from the paddling I had just been given. The teacher had made his point all right. Finally, she stripped me and packed me off to bed early. Visits to the teacher continued into our the early teens for both himself, of us. spending the warm summer of 1956 at the home of his single, paternal aunt while his parents enjoyed a leisurely tour abroad. As a somewhat spoiled, ten-year-old boy from a sophisticated urban home, he was rather bitter and resentful at having been left in the care of an unfamiliar relative in a small, rural community. This was perceived immediately by Blanche Horton. Billy's attitude was not at all enhanced by the strict behavioral guidelines his Aunt Blanche purposefully listed for him on his arrival. These included, much to his trepidation, church on Sunday, eight o'clock bedtime, neatness and cleanliness, a lengthy outline of chores which were expected of him daily, and above all, cowardice and respect for adults and neighbors. Without being specific, Aunt Blanche made the strong point that inattention to the guidelines, or misbehavior of any kind, would be promptly and forcefully met with harsh punishment. This stern warning having been delivered, Billy soon settled into a grudging and reluctantly obedient relationship with Aunt Blanche. Blanche was keenly aware that Billy crept close to, but not beyond the boundaries which would call for a disciplinary response. She was watchful and ready. Though childless, Blanche was nevertheless quite adept at child and preteen behavioral correction, having provided occasional in home care for children, while she was not teaching fifth grade at the nearby elementary school. In these respects, she took very seriously her duty to correct and discipline those pupils and wards for whom she was responsible. And in her small community, with its strong fundamental values, she was widely appreciated for her diligence. In fact, Blanche could not put a number on the times she had turned a youngster over her knee and vigorously spanked their naughty bare bottoms. And given the differences in gender behavior, most of the sore bottoms belonged to boys. As time passed, Billy did manage to make a few casual friends among the boys and girls in the quiet neighborhood surrounding Aunt Blanche's home. A common summertime activity for the children was a refreshing swim in the nearby lake after morning chores. Billy's new acquaintances pointed out all the neighborhood shortcuts, one of which took them through the backyard of Aunt Blanche's friend and neighbor, a very attractive young woman named Edith Parsons who, understandingly, had no objection to the benign trespassing. Edith Parsons was a student teacher at Blanche School who, during the summer months, supplemented her income with an evening job at the local paper in order to make the rental payments on the small home Blanche had found for her. As such, she was home during the days, and at first glance, Billy was smitten and became profoundly infatuated with her. Edith was aware of Billy's puppy love, and while she did nothing to encourage it, neither did she find it offensive. There came a day when Billy was slow with chores, and when his pals called for him to join them at the lake, he asked them to go ahead, and he'd be along soon. Billy had noticed the variety of hairbrushes, which Aunt Blanche prominently displayed throughout the house, and he wasn't willing to test his aunt by failing to complete his chores before play. 
Such was her reputation based upon factual, first-person reports from several of his new friends. You mean your aunt hasn't spanked you yet, said Tommy Hopkins. Boy are you lucky. She paddled me after school a month ago, and I cried all the way home. You better be careful, exclaimed Judy Norman, she caught me taking one measly apple from her tree, and I got a spanking in the backyard with my panties pulled down. And she did it in front of all my friends. After picking up his room, taking out the trash, and doing morning dishes, Billy was, at last, free to go. He grabbed a towel, put on a swimsuit, and hastily made his way to the path, which took him past Edith Parsons' open bedroom window. As he passed by, with Edith ever on his mind, his ears detected the unmistakable sound of a shower, and then, of the shower being turned off. He was overcome by the temptation to take a peek and see if it would be his lucky day. What a regrettable mistake that turned out to be. Billy crept silently toward the window, carefully placed his foot on the outside hose bib, and cautiously inched his eyes up to the window with his heart pounding. Behold, to Billy's shock and elation, there came Edith, naked and dripping as she reached for a towel in front of a mirrored vanity. Billy had never imagined such beauty. Edith's full, upturned breasts, shapely bottom, and flawless skin glowed in the low morning light. Billy was awed, transfixed, and completely unaware that Edith had caught his reflection in the vanity mirror. Shocked and furious at Billy's impudent invasion of her privacy, Edith was nevertheless quick-witted enough to subtly pick up the bedroom telephone extension and take it back into the bathroom without Billy becoming aware. Swiftly dialing Blant's number, she waited two short rings before hearing Blant's familiar, hello. Blanche, said Edith frantically, quickly look out your back window and tell me if you don't see Billy peeking into my bedroom. After a brief moment, Blanche returned and implored Edith, please forgive me for asking, but could you discreetly hold his attention for just one minute? I'll be right there and you'll witness the severe punishment Billy is about to receive. All right Blanche, Edith said nervously, I'll try. But please hurry, or I'll take matters into my own hands. As Blanche quickly grabbed the nearest tool of correction, a stiff yard stick, and silently rushed out the door, Edith slipped into a subtly revealing, sheer negligee, and seated herself at the vanity. She kept an elusive eye on Billy and hoped that Blanche would quickly arrive on the scene. Making her way soundlessly toward Edith's window, and the revolting image of her nephew's peaking shape, Blanche began to feel determined to severely thrash his impertinent little bottom. As she noiselessly approached, aware that she was unnoticed by Billy, Blanche realized that by crouching on the hose bib, Billy's bottom was thrust out, making an ideal target for her yard stick. She raised the yard stick to maximum range, and with all the energy in her sturdy shoulder, brought it rushing full speed toward Billy's bottom. It landed with a resounding whack. Completely surprised by the sudden and shocking bolt of pain, Billy broke a loud yelp as he slipped from his perch. Looking back as he landed, he caught the wicked glare of Edith Parsons' eyes as she stood by her window with crossed arms. Not a second later, Aunt Blanche had a vice grip on his ear and began marching him to Edith's back steps. You were warned about the consequences of disrespect for my neighbors, young man, she scolded, her voice raised in anger and disgust, but what you've been caught doing goes far beyond the worst I could possibly have expected. You've earned yourself the harsh punishment you deserve for such a disgusting transgression. The scolding was punctuated with several powerful, cracking, well-placed strokes of the yard stick that brought howls from Billy as they climbed the steps, entered the house, proceeded down the hall, and entered Edith's bedroom the scene of the crime, and soon to be the hail of justice. There stood Edith, imperiously, flushed with rage, hands on hips in the lovely negligee. What do you have to say for yourself, you shameful whelp? Billy was speechless. He could not possibly answer, and sensed it would be pointless to try to defend himself after being caught so openly. He was doomed and he knew it. He was going to experience the legendary wrath of Aunt Blanche. Cranking him around by his ear, 
Blanche stared directly into his eyes, and with chilling malice in her voice, seethed, I am going to bear your bottom, turn you over my knee, and give you the spanking of your life, right here in front of Miss Parsons. And it won't be over until we're both satisfied that a week will go by before you'll be able to sit comfortably. Clutched by terror, Billy began to tremble and whimper. Coolly, Blanche asked Edith, dear, do you have a hairbrush I may use for the next ten minutes or so? More trembling from Billy as his eyes opened wide and his knees weakened. Yes Blanche, and I'm glad you asked, said Edith as she reached to the vanity and passed Blanche a terrifying instrument a hand-sized, brightly lacquered, hardwood hairbrush. Blanche said, please seat yourself comfortably Edith. I know you'll enjoy what's about to take place here. More trembling, stomach heaving, perspiration forming on his brow. Time stopped for Billy. Blanche released Billy's strained ear and sat, straight-backed, in an armless bedroom chair. With a swift motion of her hand, she deftly drew his swimsuit down below his knees revealing a moderately erect juvenile penis and four angry red stripes of yardstick origin on an otherwise white, prepubescent bare bottom. Mortified beyond belief, Billy's whimpers became sobs. He was roughly thrust over his aunt's stockinged lap, and he thought, oh no, this is it. Please Auntie Blanche. No. No, please. Miss Parsons, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. Firm hands gripped, pulled, and pinned his arms behind his back. No, no, please. No. A pause as Blanche raised the awful hairbrush, saying in a low, deliberately frightening tone, you will remember this spanking for the rest of your life. Whack, 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 ow. Ow, 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 ee, ouch. No. No, please. Stop. Whack. Whack. Smack. Crack. Whack. More swiftly now, the hairbrush landing with pinpoint accuracy, stinging flares of pain. Ow, 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 wow. Louder and louder he yelled, yells becoming wails, wails becoming shrieks, tears flowing freely as the strident pace of Aunt Blanche's forceful arm quickened. Kicking furiously, but pinned firmly to her knee, Billy screamed out his anguish and sorrow, W-A-H-H-W-A. N-U-H Nano. P-U-H P-U-H please. S-T used to stop. Wa. Whack. Smack. 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 Crack. 50, 75, 100. The blistering strokes were raining down, his bottom on fire from the searing pain. Bright blossoms of hairbrush welts were brining all over his bottom. From the very top of his bottom, all around the sides, and down to the tender tops of his thighs, the hairbrush danced with burning abandon. Billy shrieked, screamed, tears blinding him. Horrible wax overlapped every inch of his searing, squirming cheeks from the crown, out, and all over. Again and again, with a staccato rhythm Blanche hammered away at his fiery, red bottom. He bucked and pitched, but could not free himself. Edith watched with satisfaction, but also a measure of surprise. Oh my! She exclaimed repeatedly. She'd spanked before as a sitter, and more recently as a teacher, but the spankings she'd administered had been applied by hand and were of comparatively short duration. The spanking Billy was receiving was certainly neither of those. But the boy had earned it. The painful strokes echoed throughout Edith's bedroom together with Billy's howls and shrieks for a minute more. Then Edith felt that Billy had learned his painful and humiliating lesson. Blanche, she said, I think Billy has now paid a sufficient price for his wrongdoing. Blanche paused, to Billy's momentary relief, and vehemently insisted, Billy, you apologize to Miss Parsons right this instant. Billy turned his tear-stained, agonized face toward Edith, but his uncontrollable sobbing made it impossible to utter an intelligible word. This suggested reluctance to Blanche. She became incensed. 
I told you to apologize, she screamed. Blanche leveraged her legs between Billy's and spread them wide while still pressing him firmly over her ample thighs. This had the effect of spreading his cheeks as well, and exposing a previously untouched area to the final onslaught which then took place. Blanche again raised the hairbrush, and with force equivalent to the first punishing swats, she peppered the inside sections of Billy's bottom. Smack. Smack. Crack. Crack. Whack. Screams and tears again erupted from Billy, making the apology he knew he had to voice before his torture would end that much harder. He tried to gather his breath and spit out the words as quickly as he could, but his aunt was spanking at such a rapid pace that three swats would fall before he could catch his breath enough to scream out each syllable of what translated to, I'm sorry miss, and then mercifully, the ferocious spanking ended. With a sharp tug on his ear, Billy found himself standing face to face with his furious aunt. His hands immediately went to his throbbing bottom in a vain effort to soothe the intense pain and burning heat. His bottom was hot to his touch, terribly swollen, and the skin felt tough and leather-like. He could barely see through the tears flowing from his eyes, his entire body quaked and shuddered. He could not control his sobbing and crying as he pitifully gasped for breath. Put your hands at your sides, Blanche demanded. I want Edith to clearly see the effects of a good, sound spanking. He obeyed, and Edith was astounded. Billy's once pink striped bottom was now beyond crimson. Whitish blotches were surrounded by the bruising outline, which the hairbrush had traced over the entire surface of his plump bottom. Now turn around and face Miss Parsons. I want to hear a sincere apology from you. If I don't, I'll march you down to the lake and repeat this very same spanking in front of all your friends and everyone else at the beach. Meekly, and with sincere contrition and remorse, Billy turned and raised his eyes to those of Edith Parsons. PP please, MM Miss PP Parsons, sniff, 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 shudder, sob. FF forgive in me F for B being N naughty. I'm S so ashamed for what I did, sniff, sniff, sob, tremble. I D deserve to be SP spanked, and I'll never do anything like this again. Billy dear, said Edith sympathetically, I accept your apology. And I truly hope that don't get into mischief around me again. Your Aunt Blanche has just shown me how to deal with you. You can trust that if you give me cause, I'll turn you over my knee, the same hairbrush will be in my hand, and I'll spank your bare bottom as long and hard as your Aunt Blanche just did. With a gulp and a sniffle, Billy simply nodded, knowing that Edith would not hesitate to make good on her promise. Blanche confirmed his fears. Edith, you have my permission, at any time, and without notice, to paddle this little boy's bee bottom at your discretion. Then to Billy, and now young Mr. Horton, we are going home where you'll spend the rest of the day in your room. And if I hear one peep out of you, the entire neighborhood will hear you screaming from the next spanking I'll give you. Gripping his hand firmly, Blanche tugged Billy toward Edith's rear door. She made no effort to retrieve or replace Billy's bathing suit, which he'd kicked across the room, and he was terrified of what might happen if he said something or tried to get the suit himself. On their return from the lake, Billy's friends thought sure they saw an angry Blanche Horton marching someone with a very red bottom into the back door of her house. The sorry victim looked an awful lot like Billy Horton, they concluded. While all of them liked Billy, they all felt genuine relief that it was he, not they, who had earned that determined disciplinarian's wrath. Billy obediently and timidly spent the remainder of that eventful day in his room, laying face down on his bed, his bare bottom raised up as high as he could place it, trying to catch whatever breeze might cool it slightly. He wasn't sure how Aunt Blanche knew it would take a week for him to sit down without soreness, but it did. As the summer wore on, Billy tried his best to avoid trouble and the blistering spankings, which would surely follow. But it seemed that Aunt Blanche narrowed the margins of tolerance and watched him even closer. She spanked him seven more memorable times that summer. 
Gratefully, five of the spankings were administered in private, and while they were probably heard by anyone close to Blant's house, at least they couldn't be seen. To his great shame, however, Billy was briskly spanked in front of his friends for sassing Aunt Blanche. And to his absolute horror, he was soundly spanked, bare-bottomed, in a crowded market, because he'd been pouting. Each of the seven spankings were as excruciatingly painful and humiliating as the first one Blanche had given him in view of Miss Parsons. And despite his best intentions, he was bewitched by Edith Parsons. Edith found the need, and paddled his bare bottom twice with that awful hairbrush. Billy simply could not suppress the temptation of Edith's bedroom window, and he paid the wailing, red-bottomed price after both voyeuristic attempts. Billy was enormously relieved when his parents finally returned and removed him from the agonizing scrutiny of Aunt Blanche. He thought that was the last he'd see of her. To his great misfortune, however, he was obligated to a shorter visit three years later, and the very thought of it terrified him. His hopes of being too old at age 13 to be spanked were quickly dispelled by his strict aunt. Her expectations had risen, and once again, Billy's pants were lowered. Billy learned that a spanked 13-year-old bottom was every bit as painful as a spanked 10-year-old bottom, and that he could, and did, scream just as loud. My third experience of corporal punishment in my life was delivered by my auntie. My brother, Felipe, and I were staying with her, as our parents had gone away for the weekend to celebrate their wedding anniversary. If you can call what happened an overreaction, as I do, and did at the time, the stress of managing two unruly youngsters for my aunt, who was quite a bit older than her brother, my dad, perhaps explains it. We had to share a room at her place which we didn't like at first. But as we sat up late talking, there was a lot of giggling and laughter. Twice, my aunt knocked on the door and told us to be quiet, which was fair enough as her room was next to ours. At last, she commanded silence on the threat of punishment. We made it about five minutes before the door flew open again. The talking is bad enough. But the language I hear coming out of you too is a disgrace. We blushed. We'd been swearing like sailors and not even realizing it. We didn't swear in front of our parents, but we'd let our filters down at our auntie's place. Your father gave me full permission to punish you as I see fit. You'll be returning to bed with sore bottoms tonight. Downstairs, both of you. In silence, we sloped down the stairs and followed our aunt into the living room. Wait there. She disappeared into the kitchen. A moment later, she was back with a flat, wide wooden spoon. Felipe's eyes widened and my heart began to beat against my ribs. Who is first? She asked. My brother stepped forward, and I was impressed with the dignity with which he comported himself. There was no crying or begging. He stepped forward with his head held high and volunteered to go first. I won't humiliate you by letting you see each other chastisement. Miriaye, wait in the kitchen. I went to the kitchen, but of course, I kept the door open just a crack and peeked through. I watched as my brother was told to kneel on the sofa, which my auntie had aligned with another chair. The sofa arm and the chair arm were together and, draped over the arms, your bottom would be pushed up. I watched through the crack of the door as Felipe obeyed, again with impressive calm and dignity. I hoped I would keep my cool so well. My auntie raised the spoon and began to smack Felipe's bottom with it. She raised her arm high and brought it down hard and fast, again and again, and he trembled on each impact. I'd quickly seen enough pulled the door to and sat at the kitchen table, aghast at what was to come for me. The sound was awful. Crack, 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 so many whacks. I began to watch the clock, and only then did I realize how late it was. It was nearly half past two. No wonder our aunt had been annoyed at us for making noise. For five long minutes, I heard my aunt bellable poor Felipe with that spoon, and his resolve broken, I heard him cry out. Ow! 
Ow. Ow, near the end. At last, the sound stopped, and I heard my aunt say, fetch your sister. Felipe came in, limping, his eyes wet with tears and clutching his rear end. Go on, was all he managed to say. I entered the living room, my heart about to burst. There was a lump in my throat, and I willed myself not to cry. Right, there is no favoritism in this house. You will be treated the same as your brother. I want you bent over these arms on your knees. And she tapped the chair arms with the spoon. I did as auntie told me, praying Felipe was not doing as I had done and watching me in my humiliation. I felt sick with nerves, as I climbed onto the sofa and lowered my stomach onto the chair arms. I noted that this position was, at least, more comfortable than standing on my feet, bent over the kitchen table. Five minutes of this should clean out your mouth, she said grimly. The spoon stuck my left side, then my right. The first blows were not really painful. But after about 90 seconds, every inch of my bottom had been smacked and the blows continued to rain down. The spanks of the spoon that had already been hit hurt a lot, yet still, they continued. At last, I cried out in pain, something I'd never done while being slippered. The blows on already bruised flesh were just too much. Tears welled up and I remember saying, please, enough. There was to be no mercy. I guess it was five minutes she beat me for, but I was in too much pain to really think by the end. It was agonizing. At last, it was over. Auntie called Felipe in. My brother entered, and now I was the emotional one and he had time to calm down. He was, however, still clutching his bottom. Back to bed. Not one word out of you till morning, said my auntie. As soon as I was in bed, I burst into tears. The punishment, I felt, had been excessive for the crime. A few smacks for swearing might have been in order, but this was a serious beating. Felipe agreed for he was not tearful, but angry. I heard him muttering curses under his breath, and he later furiously complained to Dad. Of course, Father took his sister's side. It was the last time we ever swore at our aunt's house, but not the last time we were to be punished. I expect that I am not the only one who discovered at an early age that corporal punishment was of special interest. I now realize that many people share this interest, and presumably this was the case at school. I think it likely that I was not the only one in the class who was turned on by the sight of a female getting her firm little bottom soundly whacked. In truth I only witnessed such a thing once, but the girls in the class regularly got to see the boys getting the cane or slipper. If they did find the sight of someone taking a hiding stimulating, my classmates kept their thoughts to themselves, and it would be interesting to know how others may have felt. In the course of their dirt digging, our research team has come across the case of a man who is able to perform sexually only if the woman he is with describes to him, immediately before and during Congress, the corporal punishment she received, inflicted or witnessed at school. Since each woman, unless she is a middle-aged or an elderly kinky teacher, has only a few instances to relate, his relationships are destined to last for a short time. He has never given or received any form of corporal punishment and blames what he describes as this curse of the spanking fetish on an event he witnessed as a child at primary school when a girl was spanked in front of the class. It was 1959. I was eight and in my last term at primary school before moving on to the lower school of a large boy's grammar. My friend Valerie and I were playing a silly game in class, paying no attention to the lesson. The game involved each of us in turn holding up a hand while the other tried to touch the hand with their tongue, while the first child tried to avoid it. Amazingly, the teacher, Mrs. Roberts, didn't notice. The lesson ended, it was morning break and I went out into the playground. But after a few minutes Valerie came looking for me. I'm afraid we've got to go and see the headmistress. Janice, I forget the wretched girl's real name, to the has told on us. Study, 
both the head, a frumpy spinster named Miss House, and Mrs. Roberts were waiting for us. We got a terrible dressing down, then Miss House said, Thank you, Mrs. Roberts, I'll deal with these two now. Miss House went to a cupboard and took out a big old gym shoe. She told Valerie to face the wall, then ordered me to touch my toes. I got six wax across my shorts. Despite the protection, it hurt horribly and I was crying by the time she had finished. Then we had to change places and it was poor Valerie's turn. It must have been worse for her, because she had only her summer gingham dress for protection. Then we went back to our classroom in tears and rubbing our bottoms. We spent the next lesson squirming miserably on our hard benches, but nothing was heard of the matter again. Except that's not what actually happened. The story is completely trued up to, and including the dressing down from the headmistress. But we weren't spanked, nor did we receive any other formal punishment. Instead, Miss House and Mrs. Roberts humiliated us in front of the rest of the class for days on end. Whenever we said or did something it was, here come the thumbsuckers, or that was one of the thumbsuckers. As well as being very humiliating, these comments were irritating, because they showed that the teachers hadn't understood the game we were playing. Surely a slippering of the kind I have described would have been better, more effective, and less cruel than what actually happened. I grew up a somewhat undisciplined child, I was adopted at the age of three, and my new parents were too afraid to give me what I needed, i.e. a damn good spanking, for fear of having me taken away. So by the time I was in my teens, I pretty much got away with everything. Then one day I came home to find my mother and her friend Mrs. Johnson, from a few houses down the block, talking at the dining table. Without any thought, I interrupted their conversation to ask my mom something. My mother ignored my rudeness. Mrs. Johnson did not. Instead, she reached out and grabbed one of my wrists. She then looked me straight in the eye and said, If you were one of my children, I'd wallop your behind for interrupting like that. I thought of what she said for weeks afterwards. I'm not sure how much longer it was after that, but one evening my parents went out and took me to Mrs. Johnson's house so she could babysit me. I personally felt I was a bit too old to have a babysitter, but I couldn't stay home alone either. The evening went pretty well until I was told to put on my pajamas ready for bed. I put up a fuss, but eventually changed into my nightclothes. After I had done so, Mrs. Johnson called me into the living room. When I got there, she was sitting on a wooden armless chair. She called me over to stand in front of her, and then gave me a lecture, for about fifteen minutes, on why I was going to be spanked. Before I knew it, I was across her lap to be spanked. I had never felt such fire, but the strange thing was, I knew I needed every smack I got that evening. I grew up in a former British colony, during the 1940s and 50s. Corporal punishment was a part of everyday life. At home, my sisters were immune. Hidings were strictly male affairs. Dad died during WW2 so my chastiser was an older brother, eight years my senior, who used to joke that he knew the pimples on my backside rather better than those on my face. He labored in a quarry to put food on our table and was remarkably mature for his age. He did his best to be a father for me. I attended Boys Brigade, a church version of Scouts, and was often spanked on the clothed seat by one of the leaders. He was a straight-laced older youth the sort we used to call a muscular Christian. During a holiday on a farm, I carelessly left a gate open and the dairy herd all strayed onto the road. My farmer uncle leathered me on the bare bum as though I was his own. At primary school we were strapped on the outstretched hands. That, it seemed to me, required true discipline, to keep holding your hand up despite every instinct screaming at you to pull it out of harm's way. At least when the target was the backside the teacher and the thirty pairs of eyes belonging to your classmates could not see any hurt mirrored on your face. Our teachers were mostly spinster ladies, 
one of whom tended to glow after administering a strapping. We had one male teacher, fresh from college, who kept me after school a few times and strapped me on the clothed backside. Afterwards, his face was redder than my bottom looked when I checked it in the bathroom mirror at home. During my first year, at high school, I was caned on 28 separate occasions, which I think was probably below average for the rest of my classmates. Mostly one or two strokes, usually from the head boy, Prefect, although I did receive a memorable sixer from the duty master, who caught me retrieving a ball from the railway line beside the school. Corporal punishment was so matter-of-fact. For most lads, it was just a hazard of everyday life. Disagreeable, but you got over it. We swam naked in the school pool. Boys who dived off the tower above the fence line were required to wear togs. Heaven forbid any passing housemaid from the boarding establishment should catch a glimpse of healthy young male buttocks or wedding tackle. Comics and those annuals from home, which an aunt sent me for birthdays and Christmas, often had a school story or two. Beatings were usually light-hearted affairs as in the Billy Bunter stories. The reality was different. A beating hurt. Our high school punishments were always on the clothed backside. This was just part of the strict, authoritarian form of teaching where boys sat, with arms folded on the desks in front of them and spoke only when asked a question by a master. Today, boys are suspended from school. Their bad behavior rewarded with a holiday. What sort of message does that send? There was nothing ambiguous about a sore bottom. Most lads of my generation left school with a decent education, which helped a very great deal during adult life. One or two of us became fixated on corporal punishment, but the majority did not. I think CP is probably best relegated to history books, given the glowing spinster and that red-faced teacher of my youth. Besides, can you imagine any lad in 2003 cooperating by bending over the way we did? I can understand why today it seems incredible that people at school were ever punished by methods which today are seen as potentially or entirely illegal, but in the UK, unfortunately, it was the case that they were, and at that date, it was entirely legal. My school was not unique and given it was in the South East, was probably capable of being described as being in the forefront of educational good practice, as usual as imported from the USA, particularly as it was one of the first designated full comprehensives in London, never mind anywhere else. I do know from my husband and other friends and relations from the north of England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland that corporal punishment in the 60s and 70s was very generally applied for both sexes, and thinking carefully, that hardly any of my immediate relations or acquaintances avoided receiving or personally witnessing some formal corporal punishment during their time at school. Today it does sound incredible. When I went to school it was life as we knew it, and it was the same for me as thousands of UK schoolgirls during the 60s. One of the factors we forget is that during the 60s in the UK many single-sex schools were being combined. This unfortunately in practice often meant that the headmistress of the very efficient girls' high school would be displaced in favour of the headmaster of the school they were being combined with under comprehensivization. The disciplinary system would therefore in many cases be biased towards the male grammar school model, itself based on the public schools. This is what I believe I and my girl colleagues suffered from, although in its general form the basic idea was not wrong. Which is why I can accept the discipline I received as a schoolgirl. When we look at cases such as the Northwich, Leftwich Green, high school situation in the mid-70s, what many people do not know is that Janet Dines, headmistress, resigned fairly soon after the case relating to the use of the cane had been dismissed on principle. This was not related to the use of CP, but she simply refused to accept that her all-girls high academic performance grammar school should become a state-run mixed comprehensive school. The personal issue was that she would not be the head teacher, as the male head of the combined boys' school would take over. Dreadful but true. 
Mary McCarthy's autobiography, Memories of a Catholic Childhood, goes into some detail of the spankings she had on her bare bottom from her foster uncle, an aunt belt from him, hairbrush from her. Roald Dahl in Boy describes many of the canings he had in two schools, one a prep school in Cardiff, the other in public school. When I was in the Royal Navy I remember reading the story of Dartmouth College for midshipmen. This described the beatings given to the cadets. One of my fellow officers told me of the beatings he had been given when he was at that college, and confirmed that the stories in this book were true. I once read a darned good fictional story where a girl in a convent school was caught committing beastly behavior and was beaten on her bottom by the sister superior as a punishment, and she had an estranged feeling while she was being beaten. I also read in a fictional story about Eton College where one of the prefects had strange feelings while watching a boy being beaten by a fellow prefect. The Glorious Fourth of June, I think it was called. There was also a novel called Marbella, where a chap spanked his girlfriend as a punishment when they were playing games. She had to pretend to be a maid, and was spanked on her bottom for allegedly spilling coffee on an invisible visitor. I can also remember reading a good fictional story about a romance between a 16-year-old schoolboy and a girl. He did something wrong and was beaten. When he was ordered to prepare himself, he was astounded because he did not consider he had done anything serious enough to justify being beaten on the bare bottom. He showed his disgust by removing all his clothes. He still got caned, however. The Battle of the Villa Fiorita, by Roma Godden, 1907-1998, has a short description of an M or F spanking. The spanking was included in the film of the same title made in 1963. Rob is the father of Pia, a girl of about ten. They are seated round a dining table with other members of the family. Pia refuses to eat and Rob jerked Pia out of her chair and in a second, she was face downwards across his knee. He turned up her skirt, showing her little rump outlined in snowy white briefs edged with lace. You asked for it, you shall have it, said Rob, and before all their eyes, he gave her a good spanking. Hugh and Caddy sat too shocked to speak. Fanny was white to the lips. Only Gilietta watched with amusement in her eyes as if this were entirely natural. At last the sound of the slaps ceased and Rob lifted Pia off that powerful knee. I grew up in South Africa during the 1970s and corporal punishment was a normal part of everyday life across the ethnicities. Us youngsters knew that spanking went on both at home and in school, and no one thought much about it, apart from the odd bit of teasing for the unlucky culprit. I was an only child, and my mother was typically strict for a bore. I got my first smacked bottoms when I was only little, though I can't really remember being over my mother's knee for discipline until I was a little older. From six years upward, my mother's favored implement for spanking me was a wooden paddle of the type most often seen in the US. This was delivered over mum's knee in the time-honored fashion, and it stung unbelievably. After I had been given the paddle, my bottom would be stinging for hours afterwards. The paddle was a novelty item mum bought somewhere locally, I believe, but I've no real idea where it came from and I've never seen another like it in my life. I don't think it was custom-made, though because it was transfer printed. The paddle was just over a foot long and maybe four or five inches wide. It was fairly thin, maybe about a quarter of an inch. Near the handle was a cartoon-like drawing of a youngster and her mother. The mother looked stern and was wagging her finger at her daughter. The most curious thing about it was the rhyme next to the drawing. I have seen lots of American paddles with either drawings, slogans or even little poems, but never this one. It read, Lay the offender on her tum, then smack her hard across the bum, she will cry and implore not to be given any more, but this is what you bought me for, so make that bottom red and sore. When I had been naughty, mum would take me to her bedroom, where the paddle was kept in a drawer. I was always spanked privately, to her credit. 
The paddle would come out and then mum would get me prepared. Then came an unusual part of the ritual. Mum would show me the paddle, and I would have to read out the rhyme, usually by now very tearfully and between sobs. Then mum would say something like, So that's what's going to have to happen, isn't it? Then she would pat her knee and I would have to go over. As I say, when she thought I needed a spanking, mum didn't hold back at all. I always rose from her lap with a ringing, stinging behind and in floods of tears. Mum would then put the paddle away, there would be a hug of forgiveness, and then I would be sent to my own bedroom for a little while to think about what I had done. I would love to find a paddle like the one mum had now, as I must admit growing up with spankings has left me with something of a taste for them as a woman, but I've never been able to find one even similar. When I cleared mum's house out after she went into a care home, I found quite a bit of childhood memorabilia, but alas not the naughty paddle, as she sometimes called it. Mum stopped spanking me as I got older and I dare say it went in the trash, as she had no further use for it.